So thank you everyone for the patience. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight for the Houston Asian American Archives first artist talk series. My name is Anne Shi. I'm the associate curator of the archive and the curator of the current exhibition Faces in the Pandemic at the Information Commons in the Front Room Library, Rice University. It'll be on view through to November 15th. Um, and uh, my assistant Ashley Zhang, who is a Rice senior, um, who will uh, who has also exhibited her multimedia drawing titled Caution. Um, she'll be collecting questions from the audience and assisting during the talk tonight. Um, the Faces in the Pandemic Artist Talk series is program in juncture with the exhibition, which contextualizes our moment in history in 2020, which is a year highlighted by the public health crisis of COVID-19 pandemic, the social unrest, the humanitarian crisis of the murder of the George Floyd due to police brutality and the upcoming election. The exhibition demonstrates the artist's response to these issues and their contribution towards the Houston contemporary art scene, the text and art scene and beyond. It marks the rising impacts of artists of Asian descent. And for most of these artists, America is the country where they call home. It is where they were born in and where they spent most of their lives in. The exhibition also emphasized the important roles the entire artist community play and serve in the, com in the pandemic and the need for creativity, healing and empowerment through the gathering, preservation and propagation of voices. During this time of crisis, artists have be has, has been combating COVID-19 and the confronting racism from past to present through their unique channels the contribution from the 10, ten artists are tremendous. Despite isolation, financial hardship, and other mental and physical obstacles everyone else is facing, these artists went out of their ways to make this exhibition possible in coming out and together with such incredible works. So a big thank you for all the artists. Um, the exhibition is also composed of a community project faces the pandemic, the namesake of the exhibition. So I also want to thank our 120 volunteers who, who are mostly Houston Asian American archive interviewees from the past. They contributed their photos for the community mural project, which is installed in the first half of the Fondren Library hallway. And they're posting their direct and intense gazes, both with and without their faces covered by face masks. The Houston Asian American archive was founded by Dr. Ann Chow at Rice University faculty in the School of Humanities in 2010 and has been running for 10 plus years with the active involvement of Rice students. And there have been over 300 participants archived with both their digital oral history and physical materials. So what we do here is to preserve, preserve historical content and spoken materials for academic purpose and scholarships. It is an archive that speaks about and studies the experience of Asian and Asian American diaspora to connect this community to a broader national, regional, and global narrative. So without further ado, I want to welcome the two amazing artists on the panel today, Sherry Zhang Hill and Anthony Pabilano. Sherry is a Rice alumni and has two bachelor degrees from Rice, a Rice University um, at uh, a bachelor degree in art history and architecture and the bachelor degree of um, uh, architecture. She was born in Taiwan and moved to the U.S. in her early teenage years. She is a practicing architect as well as an artist, lives and works in Houston. Anthony moved to the U.S. also in his early teenage years from the Philippines and first settled in Corpus Christi, Texas before moving to Houston. He studied art in high school but later pursued accounting in Texas A&M for undergrad and UT Austin for master's. Anthony is a practicing accountant, but this doesn't stop him from being active, actively involved in the arts, including volunteering for a number of nonprofits in arts, such as the Visual, the Visual Arts Alliance. Um, both of the artists today are part of the Co-op Art Gallery, Archway Gallery. So a shout out to those of you who zoomed in through the Archway Galleries group. Thank you. Um, we will start by asking each artist to introduce themselves to their and their artistic journeys. 
and the audiences are encouraged to ask questions throughout the talk, which are collected by Ashley and answered and the, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so, um, Shari, would you like to go first? I can uh, share your PPT and you can let me know um, when you would like to go ahead and um, scroll to the next slide. So, um... I've been doing art um, for as long as I remember. Um, I remember my first work of art in kindergarten that was selected to be um, displayed or something in school. And my parents were really proud and they made a big deal. So I thought that that was probably something um, that I could get a lot of notice <laughs> with. Um, and I've been doing art ever since. Um, um just um started with um watercolor as a kid and since then i've um experimented with um, multiple media um from acrylics to um from watercolors to acrylics experimented with oils um did a lot of drawing and in um so throughout my education you know, junior high and high school education and really just all my life. In college, I actually wanted to major in art, studio art, um, and become a full-time artist. But since I had a um, Taiwanese mother, she said no <laughs> to something that was more practical. So um, I ended up choosing architecture because that was very close to art. And um, I happen to be, have been very good with math and love geometry, so that makes um, sense. I've never given up art. I practiced architecture and raised a family for many years. And when my kids were um, left for college, I went back to doing more art more seriously. Um, and I've been going um, that way ever since. So my, um, you can keep scrolling and uh, yeah. Um, so these, the art that I'm showing today are mostly recent. I actually have never left um, using watercolor, but picked up um, a medium called casein. And that is a milk based uh, um, aqua media that they were using back in the 15th century. I really like it because you can achieve both an opaque and a transparency um, using just that one type of paint. I mix it with watercolor and sometimes acrylic to give it a sharper pop because the um, casing is a very soft color. So the um, I tend to use the casing on my garden paintings and um, recently I've started experimenting with using three-dimensional paperwork like strips, collage, or just making forms um, and trying to merge 2D and 3D on the flat canvas. Um, so what you are seeing right now are some of those experiments um, and this is um, a one of the most recent work I did um, also just to kind of play with the shapes and forms. And this is the most recent one that's it's still not named because I don't really know yet. It's going to be a body of work. So um, this has to do with my love of um, science and space exploration and cos the cosmics and um, I also read a lot. So a lot of my paintings are um, stories really. And the way I express that is through layering. Um, and as you can see, a lot of this is layering of, um, and I didn't show some of the layering that I do with drawings and paintings, but these are layerings of paints and, and two dimensional strips of paper and three dimensional um, folded pages from a book. Um, Forgive But Not Forget is my work that is currently at Fondren for the uh, Faces in Pandemic um, exhibit. 
Um, I have recently taken the back seat to my architectural practice. I practice architecture with my husband. And so he stepped up to take on most of the um, architectural practice so I can concentrate more on art. So right now, currently, I would say that I am doing art 100% um, of the time. Thank you, Sherry. Um, Anthony, would you like to go ahead and share your screen? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, friends, families, friend, <laughs> relatives. Thank you for taking the time to tune in and uh, spending your evening with us. Uh, but, well, my name is Anthony Pavilliano. Uh, like what Anne said, I was born in the Philippines uh, and I immigrated to America when I was about 10 during childhood. Um, in terms of art, um, in terms of when I started pursuing art, uh, I've really drawn, you know, occasionally as a young kid, but only uh, during the summer before high school did I um, did I feel the passion to pursue art. <laughs> um, so I, I pursued art in high school. I took art classes for four years, uh, and it it eventually culminated in an AP studio art portfolio back then um, with a concentration on realistic figurative work. Um, uh, true to my Pisces uh, <laughs> nature, my sun and moon, is for anyone who's into astrology, uh, there's really, there, there wasn't nothing, there, there was, uh, I didn't feel tied. Uh, it's hard for me to get tied down, um, especially back then. Uh, I could never decide what I wanted to become. <laughs> um, but eventually I, I focused my education on accounting and uh, to this day I apply that education as a forensic accountant um, during the day. Um, but, so I didn't pursue art uh, for many years after high school. Uh, but four years ago, uh, after living in Houston for about two years, um, the creative side of me kind of just woke up. Uh, so I started meeting artists, uh, other people in the community in Houston, people who are not necessarily in the art community. Uh, and the more people that I met, the more intense uh, the feeling became uh, for me to contribute in celebrating um, the colorful, diverse, and inspirational stories that I just heard throughout the years that I've lived in Houston. Um, in a way, um, these stories uh, rooted from my immigrant perspective uh, enabled me to not only recognize, sympathize, empathize with others, but it also um, sparked in me a willingness to um, look inwardly uh, and brave opening up wounds from experiences that I've also lived, uh, emotions that I have felt and moments that I have confronted in my life. Um, and the more I interacted with others, listened to their stories, um, and vicariously in a way uh, sort of lived the real present and personal um, stories that they had um, oh, and see what their eyes have seen, the more my desire to memorialize their stories and their personalities uh, through my portraiture, portraiture work uh, uh, increased. Um, so it propelled me further into exploring various aspects of the human condition and experience uh, from ideas related to self and identity in my work. Um, and just being in Houston, living here, the most, the most diverse city in the country, um, I'm just co constantly inspired <laughs> by everyone that I meet here. And that's pretty much how my artistic journey has been. <laughs> Um, so some of my work from earlier on, um, I focus on uplifting uh, stories of people 
that I share commonalities with, um, or in general, just um, experiences that they have experienced that I can relate to or understand. And um, just trying to celebrate the voices that have not necessarily been uh, vocal in terms of the visual art world. Um, so this is a collaboration work with a friend of mine, uh, Rachel Gonzalez. I created a portrait of her and then she created uh, portraits <laughs> of me. Um, this is a collaborative work where um, uh, I take uh, a friend's uh, painting, Deborah Ellington's, I cut them up and weave them into a variety of things like baskets and and clutches. Um, so, and uh, I delve into ideas related to identity a lot in my work. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and we really appreciate the donation of um, the portrait of Dr. Ann Chow and I'm sure like many of us um, will enjoy it and at the Rice campus and we'll take good care of it. Um, to uh, follow up with that uh, particular work, would you like to um, share how the process of that particular work and how many say layers um, on each of these um, like uh, composition and construction and what are say the thickest area that you layer the um, how many like is the high, thickest point in, in, in the painting? Oh, okay. So my process is uh, starting out with uh, sketches on, on paper, uh, newsprint paper, just um, and then from that, uh, I like to utilize um, extreme contrast between light and dark, basically playing with shadow. Um, in art, they call it chiaroscuro. Uh, um, basically, so with that in mind, I start out with the silhouette of the particular people that I'm creating portraits of. And then like in other dry media, um, the technique is in order to create the, three, the effect of three-dimensionality, um, you know, you apply a lot of pressure on areas that are further away from you. And then you lighten up your pressure as you get closer to points in, in the body and in, in the subject that are closer to the viewer. Uh, so I utilized that uh, concept of, you know, starting from, you know, black, the silhouette, and then uh, using a super dark brown for areas that are furthest away from the viewer and then gradually gradually uh, using less of, um, you know, the tones of the different browns uh, in the mid range and then more of the highlights, highlight browns later on for the areas that are closer. Um, <laughs> and then typically the, the thickest layer would be uh, the area that also include the the clothing. So in this case, because, because to get to this point, I needed to render the skin below it. And then, you know, this, the clothing will also have its own set of layers. Yeah. Wow, that's wonderful to hear the uh, intricate process and the uh, delicate um, care you take into, into um, like observing your um, subject matter. Um, hey, quick, else? quick question. Yeah. Uh, am I speaking loudly enough the, or should I? Yeah, I think okay. uh, I can hear you. I, I I'm sure that. the rest of the yeah, audience can. Oh, um, thank you. And um, if I could uh, turn to Shari to speak more about the work, uh, forget, uh, forgive, but not forget. Um, I know we spoke about um, your inspiration for the title came from Dalai Lama and who spoke at the uh, Rice campus in one of the years when you were studying. Um, can you share your experience coming together with that title? Okay, sorry. Um, I was going to, I was saying that the Dalai Lama actually came to Rice, um, I believe sometimes in the 90s, so after I had already left 
um, school. And of course, since um, it was the Dalai Lama at Rice, I um, made sure I went to listen to him because he's all about peace, right? And um, it, uh, one, um, I remember many things he said, but one phrase I had stuck in my head for ever, um, and it had a huge impact on me was his, his phrase. What he said was that we should um, try to forgive, but we shall never forget. Um, and you know, forgive people who have or wrongs that have been done, um, but we should not forget those wrongs so that we don't repeat them. I mean, that is not to say that we um, nurture these um, events or resentments or anything like that, but just, I mean, that's why we study history, right? So we don't repeat the um, bad things that have happened. Um, I, um, th the title for this piece came way after I had finished with it and I was um, just searching for an appropriate title that was, um, I guess, not too direct and, and has um, more meaning than just the painting itself. I wanted to have the title, uh, I wanted the title to be something that might um, inspire people to think about um, things when they see the painting. Um, so that's how this title came about. It's um, one of my, you know, it's, I, I know it's being used a lot and I was afraid that it was um, a little kind of a cliche, but it seemed to have worked with this painting and this show. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I know this work is a first for you in many ways, and you usually don't work on commissions and you don't usually work in um, the realms of figuration and portraits and not history as you uh, prefer more abstract and space and science focus and the approach is very different from any other body of your work as you call it an outlier um, but as you said you love rice and you do anything for rice and we really tremendously are grateful for that um, and this research and history based on emotionally intense and content uh, rich piece of work i trust is a great starter for our talk series as it really helps us to build some background and history timeline that we all need to um, for understanding the context of the exhibition. And I believe some of the Rice students that they never heard um, these stories in their works, uh, in their um, um, in their curriculum. Um, and you also mentioned the amount of research and the uh, emotional troll that you have experienced through the research and uh, involving you have to take breaks from time to time. Um, can you speak about the process of making this work? Sure. Sure. So um, when um, you had asked uh, if I was interested in doing a piece of work for this um, show, I of course said yes before I actually thought about, about it too much. Um, but I'm glad I did say yes. Um, so then it was um, time to think about what I want to do, um, how I want to, you know, which message I wanted to um, um, have the work and, you know, which message the work should embody because it's, um, it, it happened um, in, in when um, Black Lives Matter was a uh, protest and was going on. So there was a lot of racial strife that were, was in the news, on the news already every night. Um, so I, um, I guess I wanted to, um, I felt like maybe this is a, opportunity to speak to uh, racial injustice and racism um, in general and not just focus on um, our weird time, the, the pandemic times. But um, so I wanted to, uh, as decided to kind of pull back and look at the issue um, in the broad spectrum and 
both in terms of not just my Asianness, but also Black Lives Matters. And then uh, some, when I looked into the racial injustices of um, that have been looked against Asians in this country, I realized that they have been a lot of it and also against any person of color um, throughout the U.S. history. And I, um, you know, I'm not, I was naive, but I was just flabbergasted at how, um, how deep it was, how prevalent it was, and how much of it was fanned by our um, political leaders that were supposed to be helping unite us all. Um, and that played into what's happening right now. So um, I, for what I wanted to say, I thought to do a, basically a historical illustration. Um, and um, it was very hard diving into each individual incident and read about um, the victims and um, their personal history and and how what how it affected their feelings and um, and we I know person well he just passed away and a person who was um, in the Japanese internment camp um, when he was younger and and his experiences so that was pretty personal to me too. Um, Yes, stop area limits, sentry on duty. So um, all the internment camps were had barbed wires all around um, and and had, um, you know, soldiers with guns um, on duty at all times. And it, it just horrified me how just, how this racism keeps happening over and over and over again. And like we, um, we, sometimes it's depressing, right? That um, you think that we don't change and therefore it ties back to the title, forgive but not forget. Um, it's really powerful. And um, I believe you also spoke about the timeline in terms of how it is read from left to right as a um, Asians grow, although this, uh, this incident is for an Amer American audience that we're reading from left to right. Um, and the, uh, at, I just want to say at the end of the scroll, um, there are unopened um, canvas, there are um, roads, which is not illustrated in this um, um, screen capture. So um, there is definitely a lot of um, intent um, in that, Shari, I, I, I guess, do you want to speak about that, that the time aspect of this piece? Sure, sure. This was um, done um, to mimic an, a traditional horizontal Chinese scroll, Asian scroll, because many uh, countries in Asia had that kind of um, style in telling a story. And since I was telling a story, basically a history, which is a story. Um, I just, I chose to do this kind of like an Asian scroll where you, um, well, you, the viewer is meant to be looking at the work only, um, you know, maybe 10 to 12 inches at a time as you roll one end and unroll the other, you put yourself, um, actively in the timeline of the storytelling. Um, and of course, in, in a traditional Chinese scrolls, one reads from right to left. So you, um, you, you start on the very left and then you start unrolling, uh, I'm sorry, to the right. You read from right to left. So you start looking at the work from the right hand side and as you move along um, the storyline, you um, slowly unroll the left-hand side to, re to reveal more of the story. Um, but since this was going to be displayed at, at Fondren for um, mostly um, students and, and visitors that are not accustomed to reading from right to left, I compromised and decided that it was probably 
um, better and not as confusing if I just do the left to right direction. Um, and so the this piece that I did, the left hand side has a, a, a kind of photo, a rolled piece that's not so th thick, but on the very right where at, you know, the COVID time, our time, the, um, the left over canvas is much more um, because we, you know, and this is a question that I wanted to throw into the painting, like, does it stop here now? Or as we keep unrolling the scroll, does the racism continue on forward? And how far forward in time? are we going to still have this racism? Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, and I guess next, uh, if I can ask how you uh, experience ours as a, um, as someone who has two jobs, uh, I guess full-time job uh, for Anthony is an accountant and a full-time job for uh, Sherry is an architect. So how has these um, like different worlds of your um, different parts of your life um, inspired or challenged your art artistic creativity? Uh, Anthony, would you like to take that? Okay, uh, sure. Uh, so uh, accounting and artists are kind of really completely different, uh, but uh, but I uh, I take. Uh, I put a lot of value in that in terms of uh, one enables me to escape from the other. Um, art is definitely uh, something that I look forward to after work uh, and during the weekends. And um, there's really, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, overlap between the two. Uh, I do apply uh, as a forensic accountant. Uh, I try to put my, my shoes, my, myself in in people's minds in terms of uh, trying to determine ways upon which they could have you know, cheated the system, uh, committed, you know, perpetrated some sort of scheme or fraud. Um, so in one regard, uh, I'm able to use a little bit of creativity in the work that I do. Uh, so in counting. Um, so outside of accounting, uh, my work, uh, I also volunteer uh, for two nonprofits, and uh, one of them is arts related, like what you mentioned earlier, uh, Visual Arts Alliance. Um, so that's directly something that has an impact to our local art community. Uh, as an accountant, naturally, uh, uh, I'm a board member who's uh, doing the, uh, the treasury work for them. Um, the other nonprofit that I'm in uh, is Filipino Historical, Filipino American National Historical Society, the Houston chapter. And uh, it's, it's been around for five years, but uh, only recently have we started to um, get that nonprofit really off the ground. So I'm kind of involved at the beginning uh, in terms of the administrative work that is involved. Uh, but my role there is also in the treasury, given that I'm an accountant. Yeah, I'm sure they're grateful that you are able to help uh, with both the skills of an artist and accountants. How about for you, uh, at, uh, Sherry, as both um, architect and, and artist? Well, I'm, I'm very glad I'm not an accountant because I cannot, I mean, I, when I said I was good at math, it wasn't adding and subtracting and all that stuff. So um, architecture and art, um, uh, opposite of what uh, accounting and art is to, Anth are to Anthony, architecture and art are pretty similar and they both um, are creative fields and architecture can be an art. Um, and since I am an architect, I can't help but um, bring that aspect of myself to my art making. So in my art, I um, actually use a lot of perspectives and the, um, the layering is one, one aspect of um, the architectural practice or designing building. It, you, know, you start with um, an, um, 
a program which in art you don't but um and maybe that's why I don't take commissions because I, in architecture, you're basically given a, you know, this is, I want a house and I want three bedrooms or, you know, or I want a school and this is all the things that I want and you just have to put them all together and design them. So um, in art, I feel a little freer in that I start with nothing. It's all, um, from myself, I do art for myself. And um, in the in architecture, when you design, you start with this big idea, and then you go from the big idea to um, you know refining it and refining it and refining. So there is that layering of um, process, and I think that um, I just naturally bring that um, kind of. Uh, process into my art making um so recently i was told that my um by my art teacher critic art teacher saying that my art is about is a lot of layering of information and that all the layers and all the information in the end um are storytelling they're they're telling stories and that is also true i'm becoming more self-aware as an artist because i love to read and i um love science fiction and i end up creating worlds through my art and i think in architecture um i also do kind of that you know i create spaces that um, not to tell stories, but to um, provide a kind of, uh, I guess, a kind of a, a place for people to live or to experience. So in the way I'm creating a stage for a story to happen. So the, um, those two are pretty similar. Um, I, like I said earlier, I'm trying to get out of architecture by hoisting that on my my um, partner but um, and focusing more on art um, I actually try to um, get away from being uh, so um, precise and and um, and doing perspectives and shapes and forms but I just recently realized that that's just me and I can't get away from that so might as well just um, do the best I can with all that tool Wonderful. It's definitely so many layers of like time, space, and in this piece you have like demonstrated and orchestrated so many um, different like from 200 years till now, um, which is uh, amazing. And in Anthony's case, it's the, um, the layering of paper and cure squirrel and contrast of light and shadows um, through a, like this play with the three dimensional medium. And um, which is, yeah, definitely um, both of um, the dimensionalities of in your works are amazing. Um, and next, I, I want to ask about this layering of your Asian American identity into your works and how have your the um, identity and the um, kind of ancestry from your home countries and cultural heritage have inspired in your works? Okay, so um, I that is a question that I hadn't thought about before you asked, and I know you've asked me this before, um, and I have been kind of chewing over this question, and um, I think that I can't help but um, being somebody who grew up in a in a, on an island, basically with all the sounds and all the colors and the lushness of the environment so um even though i always stress in kind of um somber colors my paintings are like they explode with colors and um, a lot going on and i probably brought that with me because that's part of me um that's the influence of my where i was born and grew up and you know they say that uh, how you are raised and where you're raised until you're 12 is what um, determines um, what you're going to be like in adulthood. So I was in Taiwan until I was 13 years old. 13 years old. So that 
that um, my time there is definitely a basis for who I, who, who I am. Um, my experience here, and of course, when I first came here in the um, early 70s, I, there were very few Asians in Houston. And of course, now that's changed a whole lot, but um, I was one of very, you know, one of three people in my um, high school that was an Asian. So um, I was, I always felt like kind of an outsider and trying to fit in. Um, I personally have not experienced a lot of racism directed at me. There have been some, but um, I was able to kind of just, you know, not that it fester in my head, I guess, and, and turn my focus to something else. Um, but um, I'm very glad to see, like what Anthony said earlier, that Houston is one of the most diverse places in in America. And um, I, I'm just really glad that that's happened and um, it's changing for the better. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely remember of your oral history um, when you were discussing that you, when you were a kid, you climbing onto the roof of your neighbor to paint. And that was just such a, like, a adorable and beautiful picture itself. Um, and I guess for you, Anthony, what is your um, cultural heritage and its um, representation or metaphor in your work? Um. So I left when I was about 10, so I was pretty young back then. Uh, so I wasn't able to, in the life that I lived then, I wasn't able to fully experience uh, my culture in terms of uh, being a Filipino. Um, and actually I had a somewhat, <laughs> had a traumatic childhood back then to the point that uh, for many years uh, after I left, after I was able to, in my mind, escape, um, I push those memories in the back of my mind. Uh, only really in the past few years did I really start, um, in a way, rediscovering myself uh, as a Filipino um, yeah, who immigrated into America. Um, so in terms of heritage and, you know, palpable, you know, cultural and heritage, uh, rich uh, ideas and, and traditions that I carried over uh, to America. I don't have much, but uh, what I do have is um, based on my experiences back then, um, you know, a uh, uh, tough period in my life I was able to carry with me from over there um, ideas related to or just the ability to really recognize, sympathize and empathize with others. Because I have lived, uh, I have experienced a lot of things then that I'm able to see in others pretty quickly uh, because I have lived uh, and I have experienced some of the things that I see others are experiences. So in a way, um, I don't necessarily have any Filipino cultures or traditions that uh, uh, that I have brought over and applied to my work, but rather just a generic sense of humanity, <laughs> uh, being able to empathize and connect with others. <laughs> wow, that's beautifully said. Thank you. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, as I, I guess uh, this term Asian American artist, uh, what does it mean to you? Because um, um, I understand from my own experience that um, some of the artists reject this kind of categorization or labeling, they call it as Asian American um, and an artist. Um, what is your, I guess this might be a little bit <laughs> difficult, but what is your personal view? What do you uh, reject or embrace this? categorization oh, oh, right. um, pers personally I wouldn't mind having being called that uh, uh, in my mind it's just a label you know uh, and we 
all of us are, you know, uh, covered with all sorts of labels based on where we live, uh, who we interact with, uh, wh what we decide to associate ourselves with, what we like, etc. So I can be called a Houston, you know, Houston artist uh, because that's true. I lived in Houston. I, I practice art here. Uh, I'm, I don't mind being called an Asian artist <laughs> because I, I'm from the Philippines. I don't mind being called Filipino artist. Uh, so personally, I wouldn't have any sort of uh, apprehension towards that term. Being Asian American artist or just Asian artist, <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind. Thank you. And Shara, do you have any thoughts? Well, um, actually, I don't like labels, <laughs> but like, um, because I feel that um, when I am giving a label, I tend to get slotted into a um, prescribed way of expression. Um, it, you know, when I think of some, if somebody says Asian artist, I think of somebody whose art has more than mine, um, more of an Asian background that they carry with them whereas I don't think mine has that it's just I feel like that's just me um, so that that's my only thought yeah thank you for sharing we definitely understand and um, know this um, and like artists have their own individual um, manifestos and missions and uh, I also just want to ask about your mask series that you mentioned this um, identity that people, we all um, kind of put on every day before we go to work. And that's like the, uh, mo um, the motivation behind that work. Can you uh, share with us a little sure. bit about that? Sure, there were actually two motivations behind the mask works. And one was to reuse and re uh, reuse things that we, um, throw away on a regular basis, like shipping boxes. That's what the masks were made mostly. And um, I also just, um, so we have a lot of chopsticks at home. So I also use chopsticks as part of my materials to make the masks. But um, I was experimenting with um, just building things because, you know, being an architect, I'm used to building and I'm old enough that we, that before computers and before SketchUp and stuff like that, we build models to show clients. So I'm um, pretty good with an exacto knife and rulers and all that stuff. So um, I just um, had a bunch of shipping boxes and I looked at them one day and said, well, they, I don't want to throw them away. So they'll just, you know, just I, you know, I thought I could make something out of them. And, and that was um, during George Bush's um, term when we invaded um, Iraq and they, the country was very divided back then. I mean, less so than it is now, but it was divided. And so um, I started making the mask and it, um, some of my masks unconsciously became kind of... Uh, there, uh, some people called it um, like diversity because they, they were massive that uh, um, that seemed like they were of different background. Like there was a mass that reminded myself of uh, Greek, somebody Greek. And there was one that um, was sort of Japanese. And I started naming, naming, naming them after that. Um, and I also made this mass that was called the wall with one person looking at, profile looking one way and the other one looking the other way with a physical wall in between with barbed wires on top. That was um, my, poli my political response to what was happening then. Um, so that morphed into the idea of why I was using um, modern materials readily um, throw away and, and temporary materials to make something that has existed in history for hundreds, if not thousands of years, you know, totems and um, masks of all kinds. And these masks come from every culture, like all, every time period. So it, there, it's a very universal thing that um, humans do. 
And so I started thinking of that, why, I, why was I making these masks that are timeless out of very throwaway and modern materials. And so I started playing off that contrast. Um, and, you know, the ma mass idea, masks are used for ritual purposes, for health purposes nowadays, you know, all kinds of purposes. Um, and, um, and I uh, read a quote by um, Oscar Wilde, and I can't really remember the exact verbiage, but it said, man is, is um, man is, that is true to himself when he has a mask on. And I started thinking about how, you know, like I wash my hair and put on a nice shirt for the Zoom meeting. Um, so I'm putting a mask on for our participants. And um, that's what we all do all the time. Um, and so I was just trying to bring that into our consciousness. Oh, that's it's really interesting that you're um, yeah, incorporating that um, into this, uh, the theme of the basis of the pandemic as well as we are all like, wearing masks and masks is a, yeah, an act of activism as well. It can be political and it can be charged with messages. Um, and I, I just want to um, point out that I, I do, um, I, I wanted to ask because I saw that in your um, submitted uh, photo for the um, for the mural project, and um, um, do you want to uh, share with us? And uh, if you would like to do that, Anthony, to as well, uh, how um, the how the process of um, and probably some of the uh, messages that you had in submitting the pro uh, the photos for the Faces in the Pandemic Community Project. Oh. Oh, so the, the, okay, the photos, um, <laughs> true. So, but my basic me message about that, uh, I created a, a, a set of a dozen uh, masks in different shades of brown. Um, basically, uh, that was my <laughs> just personal reaction uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and also my way of um, creating something that I can later on donate. Um, and so I created those in different shades of brown with the intent of kind of conveying or <laughs> uh, s s spreading the message that uh, at the end of the day, it takes uh, effort by all of us <laughs> to overcome this. Uh, we might as well just play along and, <laughs> and you know, uh, don the mask, uh, if you will, and help curve the spread of the virus. <laughs> and so that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I guess next um, is uh, our artists on artists uh, session. If you, uh, both of you would like to ask questions for each other or uh, comment. Um, Anthony, do you have any questions for Sherry? Sorry, I muted myself. My question for Sherry is that, I guess she answered my question, she kind of answered earlier in terms of uh, how architecture informs her art. Uh, but another question that I, I have is um, going forward, uh, you, you showed a little preview of what you'll be pursuing in terms of a future body of work. Uh, like, wh what do you foresee <laughs> uh, in terms of subject matter and Etc. that you'll be pursuing in your next series of works? Okay. Um, I um, am all over the place, I felt, um, about my art. Um, and, um, but I guess uh, to, to answer your question, what I would create next, I, I don't know. I know that right now I am focused on this journey and that journey is be, to become more aware of myself as an artist. Um, and by looking at other people's work and by looking at my own work and trying to um, 
figure out where I am in not just my own journey, but compare to other people's journeys. Um, so that that's my uh, short term goal. And then maybe once that's answered, or that uh, has become more clear to me, then I can start um, longer term plannings. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> planning, long term planning, or short term planning. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So my question for Anthony is, um, are, are there a few, and, but the big one is, um, why did you start working with papers? What drew you to that medium? Oh, okay. Um, so back in high school, I always focused on portraiture work. Um, that was eventually the, uh, what I, base or centered my portfolio on. Um, so in terms of the material it's a, itself, paper, uh, it started with a, a, a Matisse project that my art teacher assigned to us. And uh, basically, uh, you know, given that I was, you know, obsessed with, you know, rendering the human form, uh, I started cutting, you know, the, the paper uh, in human shapes. And then later on, uh, my art teacher brought out a box of scrap wallpaper. <laughs> and there's just a variety of different designs, patterns, colors. And that just, in my mind back then was completely captured. <laughs> I was completely enamored by the variety in terms of uh, this simple material uh, paper. <laughs> it was wallpaper back then. Um, and so I, I just continued doing that. Uh, eventually, um, I started cutting into, you know, after just cutting into paper to convey the different, you know, the outlines uh, of the forms, um, I started to uh, develop the ideas of, you know, layering the different papers in a way that uh, they're gradating in value from dark to light. Uh, it started out with geometric shapes, and then I was able to you know, apply my love of the human form onto in, into that method. <laughs> and uh, well, I've been obsessed ever since. Uh, it's tedious, <laughs> but uh, the tediousness of it is somewhat appealing to me in terms of uh, uh, enabling me to kind of escape, <laughs> forget about life for, for hours on end at, at night <laughs> and just pass the time away. Totally get that. And um, the other questions, um, do you, the, uh, the portraits that you do, are they people you know? And if they are, um, do you work off photographs? Oh yes, uh, people that I meet <laughs> and people whose stories that kind of resonate with me in a way. Um, so there's a, uh, the, the, first major uh, large um, paper portrait I created uh, three years ago was that of uh, the, the lady on a golden chair. <laughs> uh, basically, in her stories, you know, she's a single mom, etc. And I saw in her stories that um, I saw parallels with my experience, you know, my mom's uh, uh, story. And so basically, I, I create portraits of people whose stories I connect with in, in different ways. <laughs> uh, typically, it's just personal, their personalities, their life experiences, where they've been, where they're going. And <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Um, I wonder if we have any questions from the audiences. One of the questions was from Alina, um, what is your advice to new artists or people interested in pursuing art? And you want to take that down? Oh, um, so my advice would be, uh, um, if, I, if I could go back in time, I would definitely have pursued art in college. Um, because I, I, given that, you know, I, I pursued a different route and then I eventually, um, Made my way back, way my made my way back to art. Uh, I could have been more efficient with my life in a way, and 
just pursued it initially. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, I see myself more as an artist instead of an accountant. <laughs> and uh, I think having, you know, starting it earlier on, um, prevent, you catapults your career <laughs> further than people like me who started later on. My advice would be to just do art um, for yourself first. Um, and keep doing it no matter what and do as much as you can. But more importantly, to look at art. And um, if you have a chance, take art history. Definitely you need to know art history. Yeah, I want to mention that um, Sherry Zhang's um, work actually have, a, I mean, a lot of references and um, I, I think we, we discussed, you looked at uh, Picasso and you look at Diego Rivera in those um, uh, in com coming together with the uh, forgive uh, but not forget work. Um, do we have anything else um, from the audience? Um, one of my questions, a uh, personal question for me is how do you think art as a medium can best tell these stories of like racism, the pandemic, et cetera? I think art artists, but um, I think we all individually have a responsibility to um, to engage ourselves in politics and social issues. It doesn't matter if it's through art. Um, if you're an accountant that volunteers your time, if you're an architect who um, do pro bono work. Um, I think art is just another way to engage yourself with, it, with the greater humanity um, and you need to make your voice heard. So, um, you know, I, um, any, any venue, right? Any venue where you can speak up is a good thing. Thank you so much for that answer. Right. From Adrian, was there any artist in particular that inspired you for both Anthony and Sherry Tsen? Uh, for me, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, um, a, a lot of our artists uh, in the Renaissance time period uh, are inspirational to me that I look up to <laughs> um, because of the fact that, you know, uh, I love realism and I love uh, dramatic plays with light. And so uh, any and all work that uh, were created during that time uh, are just beautiful in my eyes. But of course, I also Matisse in uh, more recent times was an inspiration in terms of uh, him being, you know, uh, the, the artist who kind of uh, means, made it mainstream uh, creating artwork with paper. For me, um, there isn't any um, artist in particular, although I really do like German expressionism a lot. Um, the um, artists that, um, so I, my own history, I actually started with realistic paintings and then when when I did watercolor super realism but now I do a, a abstract and I can't imagine myself going back to doing realistic work and I um, so I think throughout history all the artists have something to tell something to um, inspire and so I, it's, it's hard for me to say. Um, so I'm taking a class right now and the teacher um, is, it's an art critique class and how to write art critiques and, and reviews. Um, and the, the one thing that the teacher said um, that actually made me think very hard about is um, like she used um, food as example, you may like sushi a lot and you may 
hate Mexican food. And I thought, oh, she's speaking about me. But because um, I, but um, as an artist, you need to really learn how to appreciate art, just like you, you know, you, even though Mexican food is not your thing, you know, when you see and taste a Mexican food, that's really well done. And that's where, how you can learn to appreciate it. And similar to art, because there are many different styles or music, um, like a lot of people my age really don't like rap. And I've had this conversation with a lot of people and I've come to realize that rap as a style on its own has merit. And, and even though it's not my thing, I should learn to appreciate it in its artistic way. So that's what art is too. Another question from the dial-in is, um, how do you meet your next subject for portraiture for um, Mr. Pabiano? Oh, uh, so, of our, well, the pandemic really put a dent on that. <laughs> because I, even though I'm a true introvert, uh, I do find energy to, and I, I love meeting people uh, through friends with friends, et cetera, through activities I engage myself in. Uh, so naturally, I, I, I find my, my subjects uh, by meeting them. Uh, but recently, uh, like the, the, the commission that I'm doing right now at the back, uh, someone you know, reached out to me and asked me to create a, a portrait of their significant other. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I wish, you know, I wish this whole pandemic is over so we can go back <laughs> into the world and start meeting others again meeting people, interacting with others. <laughs> I guess there's another question for uh, Anthony is, what experience do you share with your last portrait? I guess it's the, um, the person that is um, commissioning you for that portrait, right? Sorry, what was that? Uh, the, the experience you shared with your last port, uh, portrait is the commission. Oh, okay. Also, this particular portrait, I'm. In a way, it's kind of, uh, I'm very driven by it because of the fact that even though I never, I met the person briefly two years ago and they reached out to me uh, two years later. Um, but the, per the portrait that he asked me to create is uh, a portrait of his significant other and, and their dad, their father, who happens to be, they happen to be from the Philippines. And uh, so I don't, and so there's a lot of, uh, uh, connections that are that are <laughs> that are tugging at my heartstrings uh, with this particular portrait work. So, I guess I also have a question. Like, what is the um, like among people's face? What is the um, part that you pay attention most in terms of uh, observation to um, kind of um, yeah portrait? Oh, yeah. Uh, so even though I don't render it uh, as much uh, with paper, but in other media, that's what, uh, I pay attention to it further. Um, it's the eyes. <laughs> um, with pa you know, with paper, it's hard to you know go into details in terms of rendering the different parts of the eye. <laughs> uh, but just getting the right shape uh, is what I focus on initially. Uh, well, near the beginning because ca capturing the eyes is, enables you to get a better uh, starting point in terms of really uh, capturing the person's um, image in my mind. Other artists uh, agree. <laughs> they say that the, the eyes are the windows to people's souls. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess we're running out of time. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anthony and Sherry and Ashley for uh, the help. And yeah, I, I just want to um, share that everyone are welcome to join us for the next week, at uh, same time, Wednesday, 6 p.m. And the uh, registration link is in ha.rice.edu slash events. Um, and uh, the uh, Faces in the Pandemic exhibition is also uh, on view through to November 15th, so please 
um, come visit while it's still going on. And um, I'll post a link to reservation uh, for reservation shortly. And we look forward to seeing you in the next talk and in the exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.